Hello, thank you for joining me at Bert's Books, where this time we are going to be looking at what-ifs. This is like one of those fantasy football type things. It's a Bert's Books fantasy books list, and you can rid yourself of that mental image straight away. We're going to be looking at novelisations that, to my knowledge at least, don't exist, but should. I say to my knowledge because I had to scrub one of the time, one of the provisional titles I had to scrub at the last minute because I found out it existed. Uh, to my great shock, uh, Going Out by uh, Jan Needle, uh, the novelisation of the uh, very cult interest um, 1981 youth TV drama, uh, a Phil Redmond job. Somewhere between um, somewhere between early Grange Hill and Brookside, Phil Redmond came up with this, and I never even suspected it was novelised, but it is. Now, some years ago, I went to one of John Waters' live spoken word shows. He has quite a well-known routine about uh, concerning if you should um, pick someone up on a night out and you go home with them, and when you get back to their place you find out that they don't own any books, then don't bang them. Don't do it. Walk away. On this particular night, uh, John riffed on this theme a little and got into the area of what kind of books you should have in your home should you be uh, lucky to have an unexpected visitor. And uh, Walters extolled the virtue of, um, I suppose, a genre that covers a multitude of sins, the, the, the film novel or the TV novelisation, which... Um, you know, the books in that area, they can be sublime and enhancing or they can be the absolute bottom of the barrel. And once you start looking into this area, it's kind of astonishing what does exist in terms of film or TV novelisations. For instance, there's there's a novel of Amityville 3D. There's a novel of Bloodbath at the House of Death, which is a sort of early 80s horror film which featured Kenny Everett in its cast. Um... And, like a random example from my shelves, there's a novel of Escape to Victory, the Second World War football crossover film featuring um, Sylvester Stallone and Pele. Who on earth would need that? Anyway, here is my top five of novelisations that, to my knowledge, don't exist. But I'd like them to. Number five, Garth Marenghi's Slicer. Now, uh, strictly speaking, this isn't or wouldn't be a film novelisation. Uh, Garth Marenghi was the comical creation of uh, Matthew Holness. Uh, I think uh, Richard Ayardi was possibly the co-creator there as well. Uh, a self-absorbed pulp horror writer, possibly spliced from the public persona of uh, such people as Graham Masterton, Guy N. Smith or Sean Hudson. Um, Garth arrived on our screens, firstly in the form of Garth Marenghi's Dark Place and subsequently in uh, Man to Man with Dean Lerner. Um, and he came with his ready-made bibliography, uh, which uh, 436 titles. <laughs> he's the only man, he's the only author you'll meet who's uh, written more books than he's read, was the tagline, and um, featuring such titles as Crab, Ripper, Slicer, Slasher. Uh, cover art was mocked up for a number of these for the series, but as far as I know, none were fleshed out into an actual novel. Now, tantalisingly, someone has gone and listed Slicer on Goodreads, but if you click on the link, it will take you to a kitchen implement. But to have that book, to have that book, imagine if it was written entirely in Garth Marenghi's own particular voice. Now, much like Alan Partridge, I do suspect it's a joke that would have a chance of sustaining over the length of a novel. Uh, that is, if you keep it to kind of... Uh, toilet read kind of length and format number four kiss meets the phantom of the park uh, now this was a 1978 made for tv film uh, directed by gordon hessler uh, in which kiss <laughs> pit their wits 
against the evil scientist Abner Deverer, uh, who's planning to clone humans into evil robots, or some bollocks, and uh, and he's aiming to unleash his monstrous scheme <laughs> live at a Kiss concert. <laughs> and the best of luck to you if you can get through uh, get through the mess of perfunctory acting and cheap special effects and. Um, you know, I mean, I can tell you all about Kiss's characters and makeup. I could barely hum a tune. Um, but uh, while the inevitable comic books have appeared of this, an actual novelisation of Kiss Meets the Phantom appears to be one brand opportunity that Kiss somehow passed over. Number three, The Howling 2. Your sister is a werewolf, otherwise known as... Steer bar, werewolf bitch. Now there is a Howling 2 novel by Gary Brandner, uh, but this book is a sequential follow-on from the setting of the first, of his first on which the original was based. What came out film-wise as a sequel was a very different thing. Um, it's a monumentally ill-conceived mangle of new wave fashion victimhood, um, incoherent occult bollocks, and a, a rather niche strand of sexploitation, you know, if you like them furry. Then. Uh, but it star anyway, it starred, it starred Sybil Danning, Marsha Hunt, I do believe it's that Marsha Hunt, I own one of her records, uh, Jimmy Nail, I don't own any of his records, and a subsequently rather regretful Christopher Lee. It's something you'd probably not have wished on a blameless jobbing author, but I'd love to have seen what a, what a writer might have made of this. Presumably they'd have had to give particular emphasis to the qualities of uh, Stairbar's cleavage, which evidently is a bit of a cornerstone of the screenplay. Number two, Tommy. Now I believe a screenplay was published of... Um, Ken Russell's cinematic treatment of Pete Townsend's rather ambitious rock opera, uh, of which the dialogue is presumably just the lyrics. Uh, but as far, as far as I'm aware, there's no novelisation, uh, and it's sort of an intriguing thought. Could you treat this as a first-hand narration, given that Tommy's audio-visual senses are effectively out between uh, You Didn't Hear It, aged five, and uh, I'm free, where he's presumably in his late teens. I think an empathic author could uh, could possibly have tackled that. Uh, but just how would they convey the full horror of Oliver Reed's singing? Or could they explain just where Captain Walker disappeared to between 1945 and 1951? Uh, yes, I am petty enough. <laughs> to try and pick, I am petty enough to try and pick holes in the plot of Tommy. And in any case, pinball's pretty cool, right? You could have a religion on that. Number one, pink flamingos. Now, for all John Waters' enthusiasm for novelizations, I've found no evidence of the existence of any novelization treatment of. Uh, this crowning glory of trash cinema, Pink Flamingos. The story of Divine and Family's quest for the much contested status of being the filthiest people alive. And there's so much rich potential for a book here uh, with this work's tapestry of uh, grotesque characters. There's the jealous perverts, Connie and Raymond Marble. Uh, there's Divine's infantilised Aunt Edie and her Eggman. Um, there's her only son Crackers uh, with his less than wholesome interest in chickens. Um, this film is crying out for a novelisation. And best of all, you could do it from the perspective and in the dialect of the film's narrator, the mysterious Mr. J. I'm trying to think of what Mr. J of Dreamland Studios. <laughs> Studios. <laughs> no relation at all to Mr. Ray of Mr. Ray's Wig World. So come on, it's not too late. Let's have some novels of some of these. John Walters, if you're out there, or any of the other copyright holders, I will take commissions. <laughs> so get in touch, we can make this real. I'll take payment in eggs. <laughs>